All right, welcome back. Hope you're all having a fantastic week. Today we're continuing our RBT exam practice question series with more RBT practice questions that we're going to be breaking down together. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and most importantly, subscribe. If you're looking for our famous study materials, please check out rbtexamreview.com. We offer three practice exams, our study guide, and of course, our combo pack. When you pass, please let us know so we can include you in our Sunday shout out. Other than that, let's work hard, study hard, and get to our questions. Question one, starting with something pretty straightforward. Which of the following measurement options does not provide a complete picture of the client's behavior? When we think about our different measurement options, continuous, discontinuous, permanent product, it's based on what behavior we're trying to measure and our resources, our time, what is our situation? Some measurement is going to capture all instances of behavior and give us a very full picture of what's going on. Some measurement won't. There are pros and cons to each. There are times and places for each. We just need to figure out which one is best given the individual. In this case, the, the question is asking, what measurement option does not provide a complete picture of client's behavior? So what you're really looking for here is something that isn't continuous because with continuous measurement, we're recording every instance of behavior. We're constantly watching behavior. So we're looking for something discontinuous or permanent product. A, duration. Duration is continuous. If we're taking duration data, we're continuously measuring duration of a behavior. It should give us a pretty full picture of the behavior. B, rate. Rate is the same thing. Continuous, we should be constantly taking the rate of that behavior. C, permanent product. Now, a permanent product, do we actually need to observe the behavior occurring? We do not. That lies the issue of trying to get a complete picture of the behavior if we're not actually observing the behavior occurring. So we can see what it produces and measure it that way, but we're not actually going to see the behavior that produced our product. Permanent product is not going to give a complete picture of the client's behavior, even though there's a time and place to use permanent product. And then D, event recording, is essentially counting or observing how many times something happens. Again, that's continuous. You're going to be constantly recording whatever event is taking place. The answer here that does not provide a complete picture of the client's behavior is going to be C, permanent product, because we're not actually watching the behavior occur. Your supervisor, ECBA, always begins her cases with a functional behavior assessment. As a result of the functional behavior assessment, your BCBA identified several different interventions that could be effective with the client. Based on what you know about ABA, ideally, what intervention would be the last intervention we would try? This is a more difficult question. I'd say it's a seven or an eight. It's really going to test your knowledge of ABA, your knowledge of ethics, and what we're trying to accomplish through ABA. So in ABA, we're typically reinforcement first. Always, always, always try to start with reinforcement because reinforcement teaches behavior, it teaches the right thing to do. Punishment is, is typically our last resort because punishment isn't permanent. There are ethical concerns of punishment and punishment does not teach a new behavior. So when we're thinking about interventions and we have multiple interventions that could be effective, could work for the client, always, always, always going to try to go with those reinforcement procedures first. Save punishment for last. So the question is asking what intervention will be the last intervention? try, we're going to predict some sort of punishment. procedure. So A, differential reinforcement. Differential reinforcement is one of our go-tos. One of the first things we always try and do with behavior. Nothing wrong with differential reinforcement. Does not feature punishment. It features reinforcement and extinction. B, just plain extinction. Extinction is fine too. Remember, extinction is not punishment and punishment is not extinction. They're two very separate things. C, negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is still reinforcement. Nothing wrong with it. It's what we're trying to start our interventions with. So that leaves us with the response cost. Now, what makes this tricky is response cost is a punishment procedure, but you have to know it's a punishment procedure without being explicitly told. Because why, why does response cost function as a punishment? Well, we're removing something in response to a behavior in order to decrease the behavior. Decreasing punishment reinforcing or uh, removing negative, negative punishment. But ideally, the intervention we would want to try last is our punishment procedure or our response cost procedure. Differential reinforcement and extinction are fine. Negative reinforcement 
is great. Response costs should be last given what our intervention options are. Now, this is a more difficult question, okay? But this is practice. This is learning. The more you know, the more tools you have at your disposal, the easier the exam is going to be. An NFL game is 60 minutes long. Joe Burrow threw two interceptions in the first quarter, a few more in the second quarter, and a final interception in the fourth quarter. At what rate were the interceptions thrown? Joe Burrow did not have a good game yesterday. Threw a lot of interceptions, turned the ball over a lot. What are we looking for? What are we measuring? We're measuring rate. What do we know about rate? Rate is frequency over time. So we need to have a frequency first and foremost. Well, our frequency is going to be how many times Joe Burrow threw an interception. Two in the first, plus two in the second is four. And then one final one in the fourth quarter is going to be five. Joe Burrow threw five interceptions over the course of 60 minutes. So at what rate were interceptions thrown? A, five. Is five the rate? No, five is just the frequency. Remember, rate has a time component. If we said five per game, now we're talking. Because a full game happened, Joe threw five in the game, he threw five per game. What about one every 12 minutes? Well, if we have five interceptions in a 60-minute game, does that equal out to one every 12 minutes? It does. So rate could be five per game, or it could be one every 12 minutes. It just depends on what rate you're looking at. Both work. Both feature a frequency. Both feature a time component. And both accurately reflect how often an inter interception was thrown. Okay, So our answer here is going to be what? Well, both C and D. The lesson here, one, is we don't just pick the first answer choice we like and move on. We read all of our answer choices. And two, we need to be very familiar with rate and specify the rate they're asking for. Since no rate was specified, B, five per game, and one every 12 minutes both qualify. Examine the following scenarios. Which scenario demonstrates the most effective reinforcement strategy? We're looking for the most effective reinforcement strategy. What are we trying to do with reinforcement? We're trying to increase the behavior. So let's take a look. A, Tim conducts a preference assessment and determines his client loves jelly beans. Tim now gives his client jelly beans each time his client asks for help. What's the problem here? Do we have a reinforcer? Do not. We have a preference. We have a preference of jelly beans. No indication that jelly beans are reinforcing. We always, 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 always go over this lesson that preference assessments and reinforcer assessments are two different things. Tim does not know whether or not jelly beans are reinforcing yet. So just because he's giving him jelly beans or the client each time jelly beans each time the client asks for help does not mean behavior is changing. This is not a reinforcement strategy. B. Greg uses tokens as reinforcement. Each time Greg's client engages in the target behavior. Greg waits five seconds and then delivers a token. All right, first things first, we do have reinforcement. So it is a reinforcement strategy. However, Greg is waiting to deliver the token. What's our rule with reinforcement if we want it to be very, very effective? Well, we want to deliver reinforcement quickly, meaning as close to the target behavior as possible. There's no reason for Greg to wait five seconds and then deliver a token. Greg runs the risk of reinforcing something else he does not he didn't mean to reinforce. So B is better than A, but surely we can find something better than that. C, the function of Billy's math completion behavior is attention. Each time Billy completes the math problem, his teacher immediately praises him. All right, so Billy's math completion behavior is maintained by attention. That's the function. It's the reason it's occurring. So attention is reinforcing for Billy. Each time Billy completes a math problem, his teacher immediately praises him or, in other words, gives him attention. Yes, this is a great reinforcement strategy. Billy's teacher is using the function of the behavior to identify reinforcers, which is attention. And then as soon as Billy engages in the right behavior, the teacher immediately praises him. C is better than B because it's quicker, closer to the actual behavior. And then D, whenever John climbs on the counter, his mom tells him, get down. Well, we know his mom is reprimanding him. We're not sure what the consequence is or the effect. All we know is his mom is reprimanding him. 
definitely not the best reinforcement strategy given our other options. What scenario demonstrates the most effective reinforcement strategy? Well, it's going to be C. Function of Bailey's math completion behavior is attention. Each time Bailey completes a math problem, his teacher immediately praises him. During her morning routine, Jane closely observes herself washing her hands and taking a shower. She records each step onto a notepad for later use. What describes what Jane is doing with her observation? All right, think about this one. What is Jane doing here? If Jane is observing herself washing hands, taking a shower, and recording the steps for later use, what does that sound like? Think about what do we teach in steps? We teach chains. And in order to create a chain, what must we do? We have to perform a task analysis. A task analysis creates a task chain. What Jane is doing is just watching herself. She's analyzing her task, writing down the steps for later use. Later on, she may go ahead and create a task chain with these steps. Jane is engaging in the task chain, but her observations are part of the task analysis. Understand the difference between the task analysis and the task chain. Task analysis creates the task chain. So what describes what Jane is doing with her observations? Well, A, a task analysis. It's not B, a preference assessment. There's no preference assessment going on. It isn't a task chain that Jane is doing a task chain, but her observations have to do with the task analysis. Remember, answer what the question is asking. And then D, an indirect assessment. No, Jane is directly observing her behavior. What describes what Jane is doing is A, task analysis. If an X represents a response and a zero marks a non-response, what is the percentage of occurrence of responses given the following data? Looking for percentage of occurrence. And what does a percentage of occurrence data say? Well, percentage of occurrence is exactly what it sounds like. Of the times it could have happened, how many times did it happen? Right? So if we have eight trials, what is the percentage of occurrence of the target response? In this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven trials. What is the percentage of occurrence of the response? We know X marks a response, so we count the number of responses, one, two, three. The percentage of occurrence or responses happened three out of seven times. So all we do is divide three by seven and we get 43%. Knowing averages, knowing how to do percentages, knowing totals, going to score you some easy points on the exam. Understand how to do them. This is a very easy question, okay? If you don't understand it, go back, relearn percentage, percentage of occurrence at, on the study guide, come back and do this problem until you understand it. It's very, very easy. It should be simple, simple points on your real exam. Which of the following represents the pre-MAC principle if sitting next to peers is aversive to the learner? Yeah, I know we've been doing a lot of pre-MAC principle lately, but we get a lot of questions on pre-MAC principles, so we're trying to help out. As always, when we get a term, what do we do? We define it. What is pre-MAC principle? The pre-MAC principle says you have the, you use the opportunity to engage in a preferred activity as reinforcement for a non-preferred activity. So if the aversive is sitting next to peers. Pre-MAC principle says if our client sits next to a peer, our learner sits next to a peer, they can engage in a preferred activity. That's the pre-MAC principle. So A, the client is allowed three gummy bears before sitting next to peers. That sounds like a bribe or non-contingent reinforcement. Not what we're looking for. B, the client is allowed five minutes of alone time if he sits next to peers for five minutes. Yes, the pre map principle involves a contingency. If, then statements. Okay? If he sits next to peers for five minutes, the aversive, then he can engage in the preferred alone time. B looks good. Let's keep reading. C, the client is given a token every minute he sits next to a peer. This is simply just some sort of fixed interval schedule of reinforcement, not the pre-map principle. D, you ask the client to touch their nose, rub their head, and then sit next to a peer. What does this represent? High P request sequence, high P, low P, high probability, right? High P, low P is not the same as pre-MAC. We're almost opposite, okay? Always, always, always remember that. Again, pre-MAC principle is not complicated. Think of grandma's law. If you eat your broccoli, you can watch TV. That's the pre-MAC principle. Engaging in an activity is the reinforcer 
for engaging in a non-preferred activity. In this case, B, client is allowed five minutes of loan time if he sits next to peers for five minutes. Best represents the BMAC principle. An RBT is asked to graph some frequency data that was recorded last week. The RBT draws out a line graph, labels the y-axis time and the x-axis behavior. The RBT then plots the frequency data for the week and notes a downward trend. Was the data graphed correctly? Okay, again, not the easiest question. Takes a little thought, but you can do it. Graphing questions are straightforward. What do we know about graphs in ABA? We know we would use line graphs, mostly. What goes on the x-axis? Time. What goes on the y-axis? Behavior. And then we look at trends and variabilities and level. Well, what has this RBT done? It used a line graph. It's great, so that's fine. But their labels seem to be off. The y-axis is not time, and the x-axis is not behavior. Those are reversed. The y-axis is behavior. The x-axis is time. So was the data graph correctly? A, yes, everything looks okay. Everything does not look okay. B, no, we should not use a line graph to graph data. A line graph is the most frequently used type of graph in ABA. C, no behavior and time should be swapped. Yes, okay. Time goes on the x-axis, behavior goes on the y-axis. D, yes, there was a clear trend. Maybe so, but not the only thing going on here. That was not the issue. The issue was the labels were swapped. So our answer here is C, behavior and time. A differential reinforcement of other behaviors procedure would be least appropriate to use under which of the following circumstances? One of my favorite questions because it gets you really thinking hard about differential reinforcement. So let's start there. Differential reinforcement of other behaviors. When are we differentially reinforcing? In the absence of a target behavior. So when a behavior is not occurring. When do we typically use DRO? When we have to immediately decrease the behavior. Dangerous behaviors, high rate behaviors, those kind of things. When will we not use DRO? A, the behavior occurs at a very high rate. That's when you'd want to use DRO. There's a lot of opportunities when their behavior isn't occurring to reinforce, or there may not be that many, but there's not too many, right? Because if B is happening, the behavior occurs at a very low rate, then every situation is a DRO. Okay? DRO is mostly for very high rate, intense behaviors. See, the learner does not possess many skills in their repertoire. Well, DRO might be appropriate here because if we don't have many skills, we can't teach a replacement behavior. DRA and DRI aren't going to cut it at the time, right? We have to teach skills first. So the learner does not possess many skills in their repertoire. Just use a DRO to start. At least we're decreasing the behavior. And then D, the behavior is dangerous. If the behavior is dangerous, DRO is sometimes ideal. Nipping it in the bud, making sure it doesn't happen. So a differential reinforcement of other behaviors would be least appropriate to use when? When the behavior occurs at a very low rate. All right, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Check out rbtexamreview.com. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.